celebrated Emmeline Speckert will accompany on the piano forte. <laughs> Folks, it's time for Shiny Side Out with David Dunger and Necky. You're listening to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. Take it away, guys. Welcome to Shiny Side Out with Dave and Mackie, live from the Sydney studios in Australia. A jump into the chat room at freedomslips.com while we're on the air, which is right now. Follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Check out ShinySideOut.net for show archives, our notes, which include all of the links we paste into the chat during the show and more. Listen to us on FM WZZR 101.3 in Kentucky. There are many ways to listen to Revolution Radio. Go to the website, which is www.freedomslips.com, or you can get an app, Revolution Radio, TalkStream Live, TuneIn.com, RadioTuner, Speaker.com, iHeart, and Live365. Or you can listen on a Grace Tabletop Digital Radio or driving around in a GM motor vehicle with a receiver enabled radio. All of these options are revolutions in radio. Now, Breaking news, you can now buy a CD of your favorite hosts, hopefully us, for the 2013 season. Each host CD costs $30. Check out the info on the station website. And the number to call in if you are in the US of A is 347-688-2902. Number again, 347-688-2902. Or if you're using Skype, just add Freedom Screen. Freedom Screen, one word. Thank you, Solaris. Another amazing show with a very interesting information, uh, as always. So uh, kudos to you. Um, Mr. Danger, how are you? I'm doing great. Uh, I just hope everyone can hear me and hear Mackie at the same time. Let us know in the chat room if you're having any difficulties. Yeah, so um, yeah. I think that was Mark Leslie, wasn't it? On with Solaris. Fantastic that, that is correct. Show. That is correct. Yep. Loving that. And... Um, Find ghosts fascinating. Yeah, completely. I mean, it, we're found what everyone has a ghost story. Yeah, and we did a shock cycle on that as well, guys. If you want to check it out, um, interesting, mind blowing stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, uh, different uh, um, explanations as to what those might be, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just a just a thanks and a shout out to to Hawk uh, from the station freedomsips.com. Uh, he does a tremendous job and puts it together. All this so that we can provide you what we have, as well as all the other hosts, just letting you know. Um, I was going to say, Mickey, I've actually received a letter from a fan. No way! Yeah, completely. Um, <laughs> so cool. I worry about it there, the stalker ability, um, but you know what? Woohoo, stalker! Hey, hang on, are you saying an actual letter delivered yeah, by, physical, by, by, the, by, the, physical letter. by the post? With it's the stamp? <laughs> Uh, it, it says, uh, you know, that worried me. Um, it says, Dave Dunger, <laughs> hugs and kisses, and it's covered in lipstick kisses. Covered. <laughs> so, I, hope you don't have any, I hope you don't have any rabbits. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, I don't know whether it's male or female. It doesn't matter to me. Good for you, whoever you are. Thanks so much for being a fan. And um, now I have to move. <laughs> So, so, look, I, I, it wasn't me, okay? So, <laughs> so um, uh, but, by, by the way, uh, sorry, I, I'm just looking at you, uh, at your image. Um, I love the hairstyle, dude. Very, um, it's sort of uh, like, uh, 
retro fascist. I like it. It's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nine. There you go. Uh, yeah, it's just a side part. I've got a. I went to a stylist to see if I could change my center part that I've had all my life. <laughs> and everything else, I'll tell you, feels uncomfortable. Uh, I'm not game enough to go the number four, but it's very short. It's short everywhere. So, um, you know, I, over three months, you might see my hair change different ways, but, you know, see what happens, yeah? It's all good. <laughs> so it's getting closer to uh, be, being shaved, you know, closer, one step at a time. Just keep re reducing the single hair down to nothing, yeah? Um, I like it. Mecky, mm. the... The third week, the third yeah. week and the third I year, know. the third year of, of um, uh, what's it called? <laughs> Fukushima, I almost forgot it. And That's the, the third week of MH370 and the, the mystery continues. Yeah, now, now we, we, we believe, well, sorry, no, now we're being told <laughs> that uh, the Malaysian airline might have made it to the west coast. Well, not the west coast, it's two and a half thousand kilometers off the west coast of Australia where they found some debris which they think may, may be the uh, debris of that airline. And now, and how or why that plane traveled in that direction, make no mistake, it's a long flight to get there uh, and, and why everything had to be switched off and so forth is still a mystery. Now, even when they do find that this debris belongs to the plane, I'm still flabbergasted as to why it is there, okay? I mean, okay, so we found it, mystery solved. No, 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 not at all. Um, if it turns out that way, we don't know how it got there, why it got there, and what went wrong at this point. So, um, yeah, it's odd. Fukushima, sir, my God, what, what do you do? I mean, this is, this is the end of the world as we know it. Uh, Fukushima will change. Um, our ocean uh, flora and fauna, I believe. It will have a massive impact on the United States and, in fact, most of the uh, American continents. Um, we're lucky because we're shielded uh, from, from the flow of the radioactive water somewhat. But I can tell you, it's, uh, it's, it's much worse than people are led to believe. Do, do you know what? Just on the MH370, um, I, I put some images onto both our Shiny Side Out group and the mm. shiny side out Facebook page, uh, which then gets pushed on to Twitter. Um, and John Elias from Third Face of Mood rang up. He rang me up. Well, I should say he Skyped me. Yeah, and we, we chatted. It was like three in the morning where he was. And I raised some good points with him. And, and that is that the 4,000, and I'm just part of me, everyone in the US, but I'm going to be mentioning it in kilometers so the 4,600 kilometer original journey somehow if Mecky if mm -hmm. this is really the wreckage at the moment they've someone's eyeballed the wreckage and there's a, a shipping not a shipping container it's a, a pallet a pallet from a warehouse so far in the southern ocean a pallet that's, okay. You don't put pallets on planes, yeah. Oh, and not 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 unless you really want to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right, uh, <laughs> sir. That's not hand luggage. What? <laughs> <laughs> it's my grandfather's. What? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So you can't take a pallet onto the plane. I'm sorry. Um, so yeah. So it at the moment, look, it's still out there, right? But I'm talking to John, and I said, um, the 4,600 kilometer journey, the original journey, somehow, if this debris is real, turned into a 6,400 kilometer journey. And that raises the interesting point. Flights do not carry more fuel than they need for the journey. They carry a little bit more, silly voice included except they don't carry lots more. They're not going to carry enough to go another thousand kilometers, let alone another two thousand kilometers. It just doesn't happen. So unless this plane magically went through a portal flying along like the Bermuda Triangle and then suddenly ended up somewhere else completely confused and just ended up running out of fuel. Hey, I'm okay with that because it's, it, it's, another, it's an answer to the mystery. But 
to, to have our prime minister stand up there going, yes, we're going to send all our resources at it. What two planes? Yay, yeah. And and <laughs> well, also, that, well, unfortunately, that those are all our resources. <laughs> yeah, you've used them up. Let's hope nothing else happens. <laughs> like if someone's cat gets stuck up a tree, well, you know, all our resources are over there looking after the. Anyway, so I just thought it was it was it's bizarre. It's it's completely bizarre that they look at a place where the plane couldn't even get to. I mean, mm. honestly, it, it couldn't fly that many, uh, much, yeah? Um, the radar data is still militarily secret, like for secrecy reasons. It's, it's um, uh, kept off the public view. The, there's just too much still. I mean, it, a third week. What, you know what? We'll probably end up racking this up to the Bermuda Triangle, and that's it, done. Yep, sorry, I went missing. Can't help you. What do you reckon, mate? Absolutely. Look, I mean, that, that's the thing, right? I mean, I've heard a number of different theories around this, though. Um, have you heard about the one with the two Navy SEALs? No. Oh, okay. This is interesting. Um, I don't know who told me this, to be honest with you. But apparently two Navy SEALs, maybe you told me, mm -hmm. <laughs> smuggled some uh, cargo on board. Yep. And those Navy SEALs are now dead, it appears. And uh, it, whatever the cargo was, that's, that's what it's all about. The plane was then diverted to... Um, uh, uh, Diego Garcia Air Base, which happens to be in the Indian Ocean, near where the debris is found. Mm -hmm. uh, the people were all have herded off the plane and are now, are now at uh, Diego Garcia Air Base, uh, alive or dead, or whichever state, I don't know. And then the plane was deliberately crashed uh, two and a half thousand kilometers from the West Australian coast. <clears throat> now, again, it, it's all about the cargo, uh, allegedly. Uh, that was there. So, no, I, I can't remember where I heard this or who told me or what what happened there, but uh, that sounds very um, uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, those footsteps are tremendous. My kids are running around upstairs. Sorry, everyone, for that. Gee, how professional is that? Awesome, huh? Um, yeah. So I I also heard that this thing there's a thing, a thing, um, where if a pilot has to go somewhere else. Mm. Did you know this seat? It's called the yes. hot seat, or the jump seat, yes. I think it's called the jump seat. That's um, right. And the jump seat is in the cockpit. And if a pilot has to go somewhere else, he's got enough um, you know, elevated privileges to, to sit in this jump seat. And I've heard military pilots talking about, well, the possibility, we don't know, because it, it, that person isn't on the manifest. So it could be anyone. Yeah. Anyone could have been sitting in this jump seat. But they, they still no one no one's addressing the fact that the plane wouldn't have carried that much fuel and no one's addressing the fact that the plane still did mysteriously disappear and that the ACAR system data is gone. The the cargo has hasn't been confirmed in the main in the mainstream media, which means that I think that's where the evidence is. I think mm. you're right, Mickey. I think it's all about the cargo. Because they'll talk in circles around the a a outside of it so that we yeah. don't focus on it. Ooh, now, look, bear I'm, in mind, I'm guys. I'm not holding anything in this hand. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes, you must look at something else now. <laughs> yes, that's right. You, look over there. So, um, um, The thing uh, is this, it actually went to uh, China. Don't forget, right? the plane was meant yep. to go to China. So whatever the cargo is would have ended up in China. Yeah, maybe because I told you that the plane was filled with spies, apparently. Mm. Um, and that's come from a tremendous source. And they, they said uh, lots of people travel all the time on dodgy passports. Don't worry about that. These aren't the passports you're looking for, yeah? Forget <laughs> it. Let's just move on. That was on the second day. The second day was odd. Uh, Let's just not worry about we've checked everyone out. They're fine. Don't worry. Mm. And then, of course, the media circus had to go chasing them down to try and find, you know, confirm it. But you know what? It really is. It's a. It's still a crazy mystery, Mackie. And um, yes, it is. Until they mm -hmm. turn up wreckage that I believe is real, because <laughs> they can turn <laughs> up anything they like. They can go to the Boeing hangar and go and get a tail from somewhere and fly it out. It's been three weeks. They mm -hmm. can. They could have the actual, you know, put on a, on a on a cruise ship, and just hoiked over the over the, you know, off the edge, and you know, hey, we found the tail, by this stage. Yep. Yep. So, you know, now they're talking about putting underwater drones to find it. 
Just let them keep going for the rest of their lives, yeah? Yes. I don't think I don't think we're gonna find it, whatever it is. You know, I, I still like the UFO story. Oh, hey, it's a nice story. <laughs> but you're right, though, and this is this is really again a, a, a an important lesson to learn for all us uh, all of us here. Uh, individuals, even groups of individuals, even countries full of individuals, don't <laughs> really matter to 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 the people that are in power, and there are not very many of those people that are in power. I call them people very loosely here, um, because uh, uh, you know they 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 are they're holding the reins of power, as it were, and and we are just there to serve their whim or you know to be um, eliminated at their at their discretion uh, to to serve whatever nebulous purpose they might have we've discussed our hypothesis and you know we, we've talked about a few things around that so we know we think why we're being treated this way mm -hmm. we don't know why we're here though but bear in mind that the suffering that you see obviously fam family members you know missing relatives missing loved ones and so forth uh, is is, is uh, irrelevant to to those people in power, irrelevant. It is not even a consider. It, it doesn't even make it to the bottom of the totem pole. No, <laughs> okay, it doesn't even make it. It's to not the even pole. considered. It's not. Right. It's not something. Yeah, that's right. You know, it's like I mean, you, you everybody has got <clears throat> you know different levels of um, importance in their life. You know, mm -hmm. if there are certain things that are important to you, others that are less important. Uh, but but these particular uh, uh, things, considerations, don't make it at all on the list for, for the power people, you know, for, for the elite. I know we, we're using old conspiracy terms, and but, you know, if you can come up with a better term, I will use it, okay? <laughs> I really will. Just give me something else. In, in the meantime, I'll call them the elite. Um, not in, in a good way. Um, so, yeah, so, so it's, it's people suffering, but uh, irrelevant. Um, and we might be able uh, to see more of it going forward because uh, now that it has happened, uh, you know, making a plane uh, disappear mysteriously. Mm -hmm. I don't see why it wouldn't happen again. I, I don't see why why we should stop there. I mean, you know, if, if there there might be someone on, on the plane that is um, a thorn in the side of the elite, or maybe you know they can uh, get rid of a whole bunch of people they don't like. I mean, who knows? I mean, the thing is, if something works, and we've seen this in the past, all right. If something works, use it. False flag attacks. Okay, mm -hmm. false flag attacks. Black flag attacks. They work. So that's why we see so many of them. It's fantastic. Once something, you know, invent once, use many. That's, yeah, that's right. That's actually an architectural engineering, <laughs> right? <laughs> so you know where I'm coming Mickey, from Mickey, here. So, Mickey. so, so the more. Just th think about this. Um, so, uh, one thing that's not entirely explored is the cargo. Um, the other one is the black flag. Imagine if China used that as a black flag to say that the Malaysians mm. had, in fact. Um, you know, had a, an accidental missile firing. Yep. You know, and in the end, despite there not being any debris, it doesn't matter. It was something that they did. Let's take that. Yeah, and who, who would help the Malaysians? Nobody. Well, yeah, mm. no one's going to stop it, right? You don't, you're not going to yep. stop China right. doing anything. So, you know, it doesn't matter really what it is. Uh, I speculated before that um, it wouldn't it be awesome if the plane just ended up landing soon? Like it went through some kind of time portal, vortexy thing, whatever, right? Um, and then ends up <laughs> landing in Beijing when it should. But weeks yep. later, I think I think yep. about, you know, I'm, I've got the, the tinfoil hat. If no one's watching this at the moment, the tinfoil hat, had a foil fold one is up on the screen. Um, thinking about just, you know, with the tinfoil hat on, um, what other things, Mackie, do you think it could be? Like, I talked about maybe a heist. So the heist is the, is the content of it. Yeah, maybe, sure. maybe not so much the people, maybe the cargo. I really like the cargo idea because no one's talking about it. Everyone's just assuming, mm -hmm. oh, it's just bags. They're just bags of stuff. Yeah, people, whatever they've got. No, I reckon that there was... If you're... Imagine, just imagine this. If China had stolen something destined for somewhere else maybe they found something maybe it's I, I don't know what it is you know they don't want that getting in the wrong hands maybe it was flown to the British Indian Ocean Territory Airport mm -hmm. would have made that better than the Southern Ocean all the zigzagging to get around all the radar bl blind spots yeah and then suddenly oh, yeah. you know they say that it flew that direction originally Maybe it did. Maybe it landed in the British Indian Ocean Territory. Have a look at that. B-O-I-T. 
um, sorry, o IoT. Have a look at that in Google Earth, and you'll be completely surprised to see, you know, um, a, a, the tiniest little atoll with a full American airstrip and B-52s all lined up down the sides of it. It's a significant airport. Yeah, maybe that, you know. Oh, that's uh, the um, the Maldives report that came out during the week as well. They said that, oh, those people didn't know what they were looking at. That wasn't really, it was just a normal plane. So when the, <laughs> when the planes fly at 3,000 feet over their island, none. Yeah. <laughs> They don't. Yeah, look, it's 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 discrediting eyewitness accounts again, which is fair enough. You can do that, but <clears throat> you remember that after nine eleven, you had a whole bunch of eyewitnesses describing certain things, right? Yep, remember that. that? that um, right, and uh, no one talks about that anymore. Missile. Correct. All you know, no it, it, no, there was. Yep. Yeah, definitely not exactly not a passenger plane, definitely mm -hmm. not this, and the Pentagon was definitely hit by a plane, all these wonderful things, right? Mm -hmm. Discredited or <coughs> ignored or, you know, then no one talks about them anymore. And this is the same thing when, when you've got someone who sees something that you don't like, well, you dismiss it. You discredit it, so you mm -hmm. just simply uh, uh, silence it to death. <laughs> so, you know, I love that term. You know, uh, even if it's a very severe kind of thing. Severe. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> that's perfectly no. cromulent, Mickey. I know it is, <laughs> right? It embiggens me. But um, <laughs> we've stolen enough from The Simpsons, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, look, um, it, it's 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 certainly um, uh, an easy way to do it, and, and that's why eyewitness uh, uh, accounts are usually discredited as well. Our people don't remember the right thing, they don't remember this, they remember that. You know, well, what, why ask them then? Why have eyewitnesses? What's the point? <laughs> right? I mean, let's never have eyewitnesses. Let's let's you know disregard all eyewitnesses in the world. Um, uh, you know, while it is true that uh, the more time passes, the less is remembered. You know, if it's still fresh in someone's memory, I believe uh, it can be believed to a certain degree, right? I'm not saying it's 100% accurate, but I'm pretty sure that uh, you can recall what happened yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. I tell you. Yeah, so look, this is fascinating stuff. Uh, I mean, because this is the first time ever, okay, we need to stress this here, that a plane has been missing for this long without being located. Yes. Now, people people talk about the plane that crashed in the Atlantic. I think it was a French airline. I could be wrong. But uh, they said, oh, it took two years to uh, to, to locate it, la, 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 and, you know, rescue and, and find the debris or lift it or whatever. Not true. Not true. It was found within a few days. I think it was eight or nine days. They found... Um, the black box, or at least they found the location of the plane. So, and while it took two years to actually get to the plane because it was so deep, uh, it was found very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so make no mistake, this is the first time that a plane has been gone, literally, like into thin air for this long. Not ever, ever happened before. Yeah, that's so true. Uh, you know, that's the disturbing part of it. And I, that's why I asked you that question last week, whether it, mm. it made you conscious of it flying about. I can see you're at home again. Welcome back. Uh, oh, you can see me now? Well, yes, I've po popped you up there. I had oh, to do a workaround, man. by the way, for everyone oh, who doesn't you, understand eh? what actually goes on uh, during, <laughs> during the show. You girl. Um, sorry, oh, I can see me too. That's wonderful. Oh, good job. Good job, I buddy. I was just taking um, a sip from my shiny side out beverage holder. Yeah, <laughs> good man. I actually have a different cup today. Uh, but yeah, look, I, I do travel a lot, like you guys probably have noticed by now, uh, uh, judging by my varying sound quality and uh, <laughs> presence, in fact, at <laughs> the show. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've, I found that different countries have very different uh, kind of uh, understanding of what broadband really means. <laughs> uh, they also don't let everything through. When I was in Singapore, I think it was Singapore or Germany, Germany. I could not watch the live broadcast on YouTube. Wow. It was There was some... Uh, so yeah, yeah, no, I, I, there was, there was an uh, um, error message that came up on YouTube saying uh, the content, license, blah, 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 something, really? uh, which was odd. Yep, wow. absolutely, couldn't watch it. I think it was Germany, because that was last week, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. So yeah, so now that was Germany then. Um, I mean, it's, it's really strange. Singapore, sometimes I'm lucky, sometimes I'm not. India, I don't think I've had any luck so far. <laughs> um, but, you know, who knows what's going to happen. And in China, I don't, oh, maybe I... Did manage China. I can't remember, but yeah. Look, I'm flying about a bit. Uh, it doesn't bother me. Well, I try not to think about it because uh, there are thousands of planes in the air at any given time. Um, if they were to target mine, well, so be it. In fact, I hope not going to happen. Of course, three thousand or something. 
exactly right. Mm -hmm. So the odds are in, in your favor if you are if you're choosing air travel. It, it still apparently remains the safest mode of travel. <clears throat> Certainly the fastest. <laughs> it take me three months by by <laughs> steamer boat <laughs> to get from <laughs> Australia to Europe. <laughs> that wouldn't be very good, would it? Ah uh, yes. Um, look. Um, but uh, 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 there have been um, a few other developments you might have seen in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, no, nothing happened. <laughs> what a surprise. <laughs> like, American troops are not, uh, not, not in the not Crimea. Not on speak. the ground, are they, Mickey? <laughs> no, not, not, not right now. Not that we know anyway, right? Not that we know. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen e either. But you raised a very interesting point, you know, the, um, the Malaysian airline maybe being a false flag for China. Well, I mean... <sighs> Let me put it this way. America, and no offense to any of the veterans, I mean, it's not your fault, uh, or any active soldiers. The Americans invaded Iraq and Afghanistan. <laughs> Russia has taken a, a part of the Ukraine, the, the Crimean region, which gives it access to a fresh water port, not fresh water, a port that isn't frozen over in winter, oh, essentially. Water, so it's an deep, all year. Deep ocean port. Correct. So that's, they have that now. And, and the Chinese, well, look, the Chinese uh, are in Tibet. No, no one is uh, stopping them from that. And uh, now they might uh, maybe go into Malaysia. Who knows? I mean, maybe they want to go into Mongolia. I, I don't know. Um, but but um, the truth is, if you're powerful enough, um, nobody is going to stop you from doing what you really want to do. And that, that's really what we're seeing here. This is called real politics, right? Real politics, it's, it's what the, the nation states do that have mm -hmm. the power the others are just bystanders right it's, it's not like switzerland is going to invade anyone soon um and uh and you know you just have to live with it it's, it's a reality and you know there's a lot of posturing and sanctions yeah that, that's going to make a difference who cares who cares <laughs> but when i went to Chi when i went to china and when i went to india i realized that especially in china uh, and I'm, I'm sure the same goes for russia but i haven't been there yet they don't need the west they don't need any of us People told me, oh, no, they need to, Russia needs Germany to, to buy gas and this and that. And I said, no. No, Germany needs to buy gas from Russia to heat. <laughs> okay, that's, that's what they need. The Russians can sell their gas to anyone. <laughs> okay, or well, you sit on it, for that matter. So, so they, they don't need us uh, in the West. And when I say us, I mean, you know, America, Europe, um, mm -hmm. and Australia. And there's this, you know, this, this Anglo-Saxon kind of... Uh, uh, triumvirate in, in a way, uh, which which is uh, very outdated. You know, we really have to start living in the modern world, where other nations are rising to prominence. But but you know that's that's what it is. So so Ukraine, yeah, that, that's that's a bit of a dud for Obama. I mean, Obama has turned out to be a, a lame duck president, um, in my book anyway. He hasn't really delivered on anything. He has like Guantanamo. Guantanamo Bay is still um, uh, alive and well, right, Dave? Yeah, that was the first. <laughs> I remember the promises. You know, yeah, Mickey, so many. I, right now, I'm. I have to say, I have lost favor with any of the current political parties because of their mm. their the lies and deceit to get in, and then the uselessness once they do get in. They they create those promises and turn them into lies by not implementing them. You know, it's, it's yeah. not, and you can't. Even, they can't even defend themselves and say, you know, what it was be, not wasn't because we didn't try. They just didn't do. Yeah. And I know that, yeah. it, you know, during my weekly meeting at work, if if I was to say, well, you know what, I'm, hey, I dropped the ball on that one, that actually, mate, that gives me one step more credibility than the, the leaderships of the world. Yeah. They didn't yeah. even try. They just lie to get in. If I said to my boss oh, at the interview, you know, oh, we can do everything. In fact, I invented everything there is. You know, don't worry about it. I know everything. I do everything. I can do it. And then I get in and I don't know anything. You know, I don't achieve anything. <laughs> That's not going to go down really well. And, and no. the employer is the people. Yes. And we're, let, we're right. letting them happen. We're letting them continue to do those things that we don't like. Now, we shouldn't be doing that. And, you know, I, mm -hmm. I keep telling people the Big Brother episode that we did, Big Brother, the George Orwell book, 1984. Um, yeah. We're only the reprogramming away from the book that's the last yep. thing if, if suddenly you're snatched from your home and you come back lobotomized and reprogrammed to get on and be a, a great citizen in the in the world you know that's going to be it yeah well, that will have matched all the tick boxes isn't that right mickey absolutely mm -hmm. so, 100 you know, and go on. i i know well you know i, I don't know i i think um that we just let it all happen to us 
there's no use in us complaining about what they've done because the first time they did something we didn't vote them for, vote them in for, um, that should have been the indicator that we can't trust them and that they shouldn't be, they shouldn't be leading our countries, our fair countries. The countries we used to hold dear, there should be an Australian anthem playing behind me right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, very, <laughs> Tim Taylor uh, bring, bring brings the tear to my eye. <laughs> uh, anyway, well, it's, it, it's up to you what you do, um, and you know I reckon that next time vote with your feet. Go and vote someone else in. Maybe one of those people who are real, a real person. yeah, but, but like Ron Paul, yeah. But, uh, well, yeah. Hey, that uh, I, I'm yeah, I actually uh, anyone else. Yeah, yeah, but but the thing is this, right? The, the system is broken. <clears throat> the system is bankrupt. The system mm -hmm. has failed. The system is actually not a bad system. I mean, if you look at it, I mean, I'm talking about the global system and and, and maybe America and, and maybe Europe um, also uh, in sp uh, specifically. Um, now these aren't democracies for the most part. They're representative democracies, meaning you vote for someone who then votes for the stuff mm -hmm. that's important to everybody. Right? That's that's what representative democracy yes. democracy means. Now <clears throat> the system is not ideal. You want direct democracy if possible. Uh, very difficult with with uh, more than ten people. <laughs> okay. Um, very difficult to accomplish, um, but uh, you know it's it's certainly a nice idea. But we're not mature enough as people. I think, and not educated enough as people to. Uh, uh, to, to partake in that kind of uh, uh, political system. So what do we do? Well, that's a good question. What, what's next? I mean, uh, because we, we know that our system just doesn't work. Uh, it's not working for the people. Uh, it's working for, for, for the few. Uh, and we are impoverishing the middle class. We're, cre we're creating a massive underclass globally. Mm -hmm. uh, billions of people strong. Um, and, you know, that's, that's, that's uh, scary. Um, well, there is nothing, unfortunately. Um, we are, we are coming to an end of things, um, unless we find an, a benevolent dictator. Uh, and I mean this, uh, you know, a tyrant. It's not a bad word. Um, it used to be used by the <laughs> Greeks quite a bit. No, I'm serious. Here we go with uh, this one. In <laughs> fact, no, no, Pericles. Uh, so, so mm -hmm. Athens was in really bad shape some two thousand years ago. I mean, really bad shape, yeah. right? Everything was uh, unemployment was high and. <laughs> Import, export, balance was, was out of whack. Anyway, the point is, the Athenians realized that. And they go, oh man, we can't fix this. <laughs> we are screwed. So they brought in Pericles <clears throat> and said to him, oh, can we please make you tyrant for life? Tyrant for life. Uh, now, what did that mean? Well, it meant that he made all the decisions. He also had all the responsibility, but he made all the decisions. There was no voting. There was no. Uh, there was no forum. There was no. Um, you know, there was no agenda set. There was. He was just the guy that made the decisions uh, he, because he was perceived to be the most capable. And lo and behold, he was the most <laughs> capable. Uh, Thirty years that Pericles uh, ruled Athens mm -hmm. are amongst the most peaceful and golden that we have seen in any. Uh, civilization, any government, any city state, any 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 country in the world. Okay, yeah. and before before Pericles, you had the Peloponnesian Wars and whatever, and that's horrible. Afterwards, there were the wars again. But while he was in charge, thirty years, uh, a lot of public buildings were commissioned. He increased trade. He built the trade. He uh, you know he built out the trade fleet. He did a lot <coughs> for Athens at the time. So and, and it was it was smart for the Athenians to do it. Now, do we have anyone of that caliber today that could do it for us? Dave, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't well, know. What, what's funny is, I think we do. I think we have the people in power, but they're making the wrong decisions. Mm. So they're deciding to opt the other way. And it really yeah. is up to them, you know. Still, yeah. I want to know why we got into debt. I, know what, I want to know why, you know, all the stuff is happening in our country. It is happening in the U.S., Every time mm. I hear them saying, well, you know, the figures are getting much better now, and I look at it, and all I hear on the stock market is, yeah, we're down again, down, the stocks are down, there was a bit of profit taking, and I, I'm not hearing this positive same thing from all of the markets, yeah? So, you know, yeah. until there's truth across the lot, I don't know, I, I can't believe any of them, just to be honest, that's just me. But no, look. But you're right, Dave. And, and you're, you're meant to be like that. And we all meant to be like this. We we all have to remain critical. Now, critical doesn't mean negative. It just means you have to be on your guard. You have to evaluate it critically, right? Yeah. <laughs> Not in a negative light. So no, no, Dave. I, I I'm with you on that one. Uh, uh, for the most part, I think our system only encourages people of a dubious character to rise to the top. That that's my take on it. That's what I've seen. Okay. Um. And and I have not seen anything to 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 convince me otherwise. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. 
I think I had something else to mention, but I've completely forgotten what it was. Um, Sorry. <laughs> and and that's, that's, that's okay. Outside, outside of the last item, which was um, that the Wyong UFO group uh, and I, we, um, uh, we got together last night for some, just some stargazing, enjoying wow. it. And I answered a lot of the questions they had by using my Google Star, my Google Sky, and holding the phone up in front of me and showing them what the, the thing they're looking at is actually a planet. You know, oh, I've seen it out there before. It's very bright. Well, let's, oh, that's Saturn. Awesome. Um, let's have a look for something else, you know. So that was really good, a lot of fun. Uh, we saw a lot of shooting stars, which was very interesting. And the light show from the storms coming through Sydney last night was uh, tremendous, even from where I live. Uh, awesome. We, we saw a lot of sprites leaping out of the top of the clouds going up. When the lightning hits the ground underneath the cloud, there's a sprite that pops its head up and goes off into space. And, oh, wow. Uh, uh, pilots see them uh, a lot, and uh, it's just because of our vantage point, because of, you know, like you can't see the, if you cover up the disk of the sun, you can see the, the corona. Well, we got to cover up the clouds themselves, and only the tops of them were exposed. It was really, really interesting. Awesome. Um, yeah. So that, that, that's 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 a fairly well known phenomenon, is it? Sprites, yeah, yeah. So, oh, okay. so sprites is, is a jet of plasma that that um, goes up. It, it can go up from the top of you know, say fifteen or ten or fifteen miles high storm cloud. It'll eject up into space like the aurora, and it does have mm -hmm. colours. It's really really quite a, a, a beautiful thing. Um, and wow! So, yeah. And there's a lot of storms off the coast. They sort of wrestled themselves over the land and, and sat off the coast on the warm water. But um, yeah, but we're also due some storms uh, pretty soon, probably within the show length as well. And I'm um, just keeping our fingers crossed we um, we don't lose a connection. But it'll be it'll be awesome. Mickey, I was going to say, um, what show number is this? It is show 8 and 100. Oh, for your measly little peddlers in mathematics, it's 108. Um, and it's, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a lot of shows. It's a lot of shows. I isn't think we've done great, huh, so far, Mickey? Really? <laughs> yeah, even, yeah, even if we say so ourselves, we we've done brilliantly. <laughs> well, I have to also say the listener base is growing so amazingly. Oh, yes, that brings me to my last topic. Those of you who are fans... Um, and uh, are on either our Facebook group or our Facebook page itself, its own identity as an entertainment thing. Um, the the new app, Meki, the new yes. phone app. Please go. Yes. Um, in a couple yes. of days, it'll be live for the Apple Apple um, uh, platform. But um, yeah, it's pretty cool. You can listen to the station anytime you like. You can get updates, and we can message you uh, directly if you've got the app whether it's running or not, we can flick you a message to tell you something quite interesting so we can uh, throw you news at your device. Um, and, um, yeah, so that's, it's, been, it's taken all my time to, to get this up and running, and, and, um, but I think, I think the app works pretty well. It's, it's pretty good, uh, if I say so. But what I like is feedback from everyone. I want to see emails. Send me emails. Talk to us. You can either Mackie, Dave or Mackie, um, and let us know you can you can get to us via the website and uh, which is shinysideout.net or you can just type shiny side out into Google Play at the moment and shortly that'll be on the Apple Store as well uh, but it looks like Mechie has just dropped out and I'm sure he'll be back in any minute right but what, what we've got today the show topic for today is deathbed confessions. I said it, I'm going to say it again, deathbed confessions, and it's such an interesting topic uh, that we couldn't, we couldn't not do a show about it. So I'll read you what a deathbed confession is, what the classification of one is. Ah, here I am. That's okay, am I back? I've just I'm announced back. what the show is, what the show title is. Ah, great. And I'm just about to read a deathbed confession. The definition um, actually, of one. Be before before we do that, sorry, Dave. Um, there was one thing I was going to oh, say, but I, I blacked out. <laughs> a very good friend of the show's, <clears throat> Mr. Hovey. Oh yes. Uh, he he recently uh, made a um, 
a video, which is on YouTube, so you guys can have a look at that. I, I don't know if you're listening, Holster. And, uh, and Devil's Rock, yes, sir. There was uh, like a carving in Devil's Rock, which could or could not be a, a visitor. Uh, but, you know, anyway. So he went there, which is quite a feat, uh, I mean, to get there, that is, and, and uh, posted the um, video on YouTube. As a result of that posting, he has now been invited to uh, go on expedition, uh, archaeological expedition, uh, that is, with Mr. Graham Hancock. Oh, That's right, fingerprints jealous. of the gods. Good. Oh, no, well, we invited, so <laughs> it's oh, all cool. good. Uh, so I'll talk to the Hofster yep. and see if, if that's possible. Uh, you know, we don't want to crash his party because that's his accomplishment, you know, but mm. uh, he's a good friend of the show. He's a good friend of ours. I've known him for a while. He's a great guy, uh, and um, I do hope that goes well for him. Uh, but, yeah, just thought I'd mention that because Hofster, well done, buddy. Yeah, no, that's absolutely tremendous. Well done. And um, it, that's the kind of thing that we're, we want. We want people finding yeah. stuff. Get out there and Absolutely. and bring it bring it to the world. Our audience is good; it's your audience too. So, so um, so bring us. I've, and I've been contacted again, Mackie, during the week uh, for more people that would like to come on board on the show. Nice, and, um, nice. Just, I'm booking. I'm booking like crazy to get these people on board. All right. Fantastic. So, um, yeah, and I think we might do an interview with John Elias as well. Um, uh, he's speaking at a number of conferences at the moment, and um, I, if he's got some time. And Jason Martell is still doing the radio round, so we'll still have him slated in as soon as we can get a date set. It's only, unfortunately, our time slot it just isn't favourable for everyone to be able to no. frequent our That's show. True. So yeah, it's pretty tough. But uh, Mickey, do you mind if I just um, read what a deathbed confession Please. is? All Please. Right. As it sounds, a deathbed confession is a confession of some sort when someone is assumed to be close to death. Sometimes it takes place on the deathbed itself, in the bed, the bed in which the person dies or lies in, a, in, in during the last few hours before death, hence the phrase. Now they know they're going to die. Usually um, a deathbed confession can be once they've told they've got terminal cancer and they've seen you know, they're doctors and they know that it's confirmed and, you know, they've got an average date. And then they say, well, you know what? Those threats that have been coming my way, that if I ever spoke about X, well, I'm going to tell everyone now. They can't get me. What can they do to me now? And, and this is the position, Mickey, isn't it? That people are taking when they're coming out with their deathbed confessions. It, it, it's it's at a point where you couldn't convict them anyway because they're about to die. There'd be no point. And oh, I'm going to call them. oh that's okay. They went away. Um, it, so it's a very strange thing indeed. And it when we mentioned it on the show uh, a while back, I know that I've spoken about my mother. Uh, my family kept a closed lips on a lot of things, and only in their deathbeds do you tend to hear anything about the family at all. And it came up as, as a topic. And we just knew instantly that this had to be a whole show on it. So, so Mekki, why don't you take us through the first one? Earth to Mekki. This is ground to control to Mekki. Mekki. And here I am. Yay. <laughs> Hurrah. Um, that's what happens when you meet yourself and you don't remember. <laughs> and okay, yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the, the thing with deathbed confessions, as Dave has pointed out is that uh, at this point people might find religion they might find the need to tell the truth so uh, can you believe them um, well there's no point at that point <laughs> sorry for the double dutch in lying I think right I don't think there's much point in lying but uh, you make up your own mind as we go through these and uh, we've got a number of them uh, which I find fascinating and um, the first one is about ADHD uh, attention deficit hypertension disorder um, or hyperactivity disorder, I should say. Now, that's, that's what uh, you call kids that run around a lot and can't be controlled, and you give them, <laughs> you give a, them Ritalin. a little bit deeper, deeper description than run around yeah. a lot. But yes, you're right, Mickey. I see what you're saying. <laughs> you know, and, um, and uh, Ritalin will do the trick. If you watch The Simpsons, it's Focusin. Focusin will, Focusin, will yep. bring your children back. So now, uh, now um, uh, we've got an article here, which, which we, of course, uh, give you the source for afterwards. Um, ADHD, I'm quoting, is a prime example of a fictitious disease or condition. And now these were the words of Leon Eisenberg, 
the scientific father of ADHD. In his last interview, he gave before his death at age 87 in 2009. <clears throat> okay? Um, now, some uh, have described Mr. Eisen or Dr. Eisenberg's statement as an exaggeration, uh, but many doctors are coming to the belated conclusion that ADHD is often overdiagnosed by the use of fuzzy diagnostic practices. Now, I'm, I'm quoting here, okay? I'm, I'm going on to quote Harvard psychologist Jerome Kagan, and uh, he's one of the world's leading experts in child development, and he says the following. Let's go back 50 years. We have a seven-year-old child who's bored in school and disrupts classes. Back then, he was called lazy. Today, he's said to suffer from ADHD. Every child who's not doing well in school is sent to see his pedi pediatrician, and the pediatrician says, Woo! It's ADHD, and here's Ritalin! <laughs> in fact, 90% of these 5.4 million kids don't have an abnormal dopamine metabolism. The problem is, if a drug is available to doctors, they'll make the corresponding diagnosis. I'm going to repeat this. If a, doc is, if a drug is available to doctors, they will make the corresponding diagnosis. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, guys, this is, of course, uh, referring specifically to the United States here. Um, and not, not everywhere else in the world is ADHD so prevalent. But uh, it, it, is, it is shocking to think that, oh, well, you know, there's a drug, let's prescribe it. Because, I mean, doctors get incentives. Now, they're not allowed to be paid cash, I don't think, but they're taken on trips, you know, they have tuition paid for their kids, and, you know, all those wonderful things. Eisenberg himself made the luxurious living of his fictitious disease thanks to pharmaceutical sales. Hmm. Okay? Now, bear in mind that his ADHD theory was just that. It was a theory, okay? All right? This is, so this is not a proven uh, condition. I mean, again... Most of the 5.4 million kids, all right, which is 90%, mm -hmm. don't have an abnormal dopamine metabolism, all right? It's, it's a, because the, it's the dopamine receptors that are affected that cause or uh, are said to cause the ADHD condition. American psychologist Lisa Cosgrove and others reveal the facts in their study: financial ties between DSM IV panel members and the pharmaceutical industry. They found that of the 170 DSM panel members, okay, 95 which is 56%, had one or more financial associations with companies in the pharmaceutical industry. <laughs> Can you say conflict of interest? 100% mm. of the members of the panels on mood disorders and schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders had financial ties to drug companies. That is 100%. Yeah, they all had okay. financial ties to drug companies. That's crazy. Now, 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 yeah, right? I mean, think about this, guys. Okay, now, this is, this, is, this is where the money is made, okay? Um, this, this is, this is uh, for example, there's, there's, there's the, the assistant director of the pediatric psychopharmacology unit at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital and associate professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School received one million, one million dollars in earnings from drug companies between 2000 and 2007. I like that kind of cash too. Hmm. Okay, now, are these drugs safe is, is the other question, right? Are they safe? I mean, we're giving these to our kids. And, and you, know, you know, I mean, forget about, the, forget about the corruption that's obviously happening here, that someone is making money. Well, you know, people will always make money. There's always a profit motive. But are they safe? What are we giving our kids here, right? Now, apparently, this is what's uh, on the, uh, but this is the black box warning on the antidepressants. And um, I'm going to read them out to you now. These are the side effects. Confusion, depersonalization, hostility, hallucinations, manic reactions, meaning, you know, ups and down mood swings, mm -hmm. uh, suicidal ideation, so meaning, you know, have suicidal tendencies, loss of consciousness, delusions, feeling drunk, alcohol abuse. So taking this drug will lead you to alcoholism. That's fantastic. Yep. And homicidal ideation, uh, meaning uh, homicidal tendencies. Yeah. Now... If you as a parent, would you, as you as a parent, would you, would you give those drugs to your child? Is is my question, right? Um, now, Dr. Edward C. Hamlin, who is a founding member of the Royal College of General Practitioners, in 1998 stated this. I'm quoting: ADHD is fraud intended to justify starting children on a life of drug addiction. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. So, um, you can take that deathbed confession any which way you want, but I think it is very clear, very, very clear that the pharmaceutical industry, which is a billion, well, several or multi-billion dollar industry, in fact, uh, has all the doctors in their back pocket, uh, well, most of the doctors, I should say, uh, because it is it's so much easier to prescribe something, you know, rather than trying to make someone better. We, we're not no longer trying to make people better. We're trying to medicate people. Let's say you go to a doctor and you have a headache. Mm. Okay, a doctor might give you an aspirin or Panadol or whatever, you know, something like that. It'll, it'll, mask, it'll mask the pain. Okay, it'll make the pain go away. It will not deal with the root cause of whatever is giving you that headache. Mm-hmm. And that is fundamentally the problem with, with, uh, with Western medicine. We are managing diseases profitably, especially cancer and diseases like that. We're managing diseases. And, and now it appears we're also inventing new diseases so we can sell more drugs and start the children off early. I mean, everybody knows you have to get to the kids when, you know, when they're young. That's, that's when you start this stuff. Hey, you know, get them used to popping pills. Yeah, that's right. So, right? so Mackie, just, just think about this. Uh, if you had to diagnose um, a, a fault in someone, uh, what would it be if it was in children? Oh, they run around too much. Just like you said, I think that I think you raised a really good point in that, and that is that it, that was just like shooting fish in a barrel. Everyone's gonna look at their kid and go, "Whoa, oh, you know, they yep. they they're not polite to me. They need Ritalin. They're not doing good at school. They need Ritalin." Yep. Um, no, instead really. <laughs> of talking to, you know, every action, every interaction with a your child, I have to say your child, is um, a learning experience for both of you, and you mm-hmm. have to, you have to make sure that that goes in the right direction. It's like a you, dog, right. sit, a dog sitting next to you at the dinner table, might be the world's best dog on the whole planet, but you can change that you can slyly give it something to eat from the dinner table and what do you think it's doing Mickey it's learning Eating it? yes it, it just <laughs> learned that that's a good thing that yes. getting food at the dinner table is a good thing and I can do it if I sit here so next time I sit here and I don't get anything I'm gonna remind you that that's what you taught me to do yes right so that's the same thing that happens with children and but that's the thing, and it's we're behavior. taking the easy way out, Dave. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. It's, it, but we're taking the easy way out. Oh, yeah. You're right. We're no longer sitting down with the child. The, the teacher no longer. Well, I, I, I'm generalizing here, but but you nobody are. takes the time to do things. Nobody mm-hmm. takes the time. It seems right because right. because real like doing to do to do a real thing to do something well to do something good, uh, then you know you need to take your time. You need to you need to actually invest effort. Right and and uh, taking the drug and just you know you go pop pop this and and you'll quieten down. Yeah, you're giving your child a chemical frontal lobotomy is what you're doing. Exactly. Okay. Um, and and that's why not that good. Like a, why does that sound like the, the good choice? Oh, because it's easy. Remember yeah. that the baby boomers all grew up with a pill, the pill, any pill given to you by a doctor is the solution. Yeah. That was the the mentality and. Look, I have to, granted, that's what it was, and because we discovered we could start to give pills and medicine to people, that, yeah, medicine has the answer for everything, and let's just listen to them wholly and purely. And, you know, as we know now, it, that doesn't really work. And nope. no one listens to medicine when they're trying to stop you from, from doing something to your health, for instance, like, I don't know, smoking. You know, yeah, they go, oh, but some, someone lives, you know, till 98, and they smoked all their life. They didn't get cancer. Well, you know, they're milliseconds from it, I'll tell you. <laughs> but it, everyone else that's dying uh, of what, you know, equivalent of black lung, uh, like the coal miners used to get, because, you know, breathing apparatus was bad. Doctors said, oh, you know, you probably don't want to breathe that in. That'll kill you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. who knows, right? Mm. So, you know, this, that's, I love that the guy who discovered that the dopamine levels, increased dopamine levels in children, only when they were increased dopamine levels, um, you know, he he's he said, well, you know, everyone else is using AHD, AHD, ADHD um, as a as a fictitious disease, just to and I'm joining more quotes together. 
um, just to be able to medicate your kids, and I think that's wrong. If you're a parent, you know, honestly think twice about it. Yeah, if you get good results from it, maybe you could then talk to them and release them from the Ritalin. You can't, do mm-hmm. that. You can't just come off Ritalin. Uh, but, Becky, I think the next topic, the, we've only got a few minutes, so maybe we can intro it so that they can think about this on the other side of the break. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah. go on. No, go ahead. JFK oh. killing, Mackie. Okay. So, the, yeah, this is, this is Mr. John F. Kennedy again uh, and his, his assassination. Apparently, <clears throat> there was a deathbed confession from a key CIA figure which implicated LBJ, Lyndon B. Johnson, uh, the, um, the guy that, in fact, then became president believe it or not, um, and this was posted um, in 2013, so this is uh, about a year ago that this, uh, that this information, actually less than a year, in fact, probably three or four months, November 22nd, 2013. Wow. So um, this is fascinating, and it's an interview with uh, his son, uh, St. Jane Hunt, so we're actually going to talk about Mr. E. Howard Hunt, and it's uh, his, his son that was interviewed and recalls what happened. Uh, so I think that's that's a fascinating topic, dude. Um, it really is. It just goes to show that power play uh, will stop at nothing, at least according to this particular um, deathbed confession. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, I, I saw I saw an episode of Jesse Ventura where they they brought out some of this information, not all. They even examined the photographs of the JFK case. And there's, there's people in those photographs that you recognize today. You didn't know them then. They were nobodies. Mm. But mm-hmm. one of those looks like George Bush Sr. Oh, yeah. Uh, head of the CIA at mm-hmm. the time. And he looked like he was involved in some way, shape, or form. I'm just saying looks like. Um, you know, it, it had a bit of extraordinary resemblance to the fellow. And a couple of others as well, and and one of these uh, was the the A. Howard Hunt. Um, yep. You know, and and I, I one of the things one of the things that came out about about the deathbed confessions was that it's the easy escape from your guilt is by yeah, being true. able to to just let it go. It's almost a form of repenting. Yes. Yes. Very the ex- excellent use. Thanks, Mickey. You've gone silent. There you go. You're back again. Phrase, sir. That's exactly what it is. Mm-hmm. I have. I'm not saying excellent uh, use of phrase. That's exactly what they are. They're, they're in fact, uh, they're you know those those they're they're, um, uh, uh, they're quests for forgiveness. That's exactly right. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and that and and the component of that is that they can't be touched anymore, or they feel untouchable. Since what what's the point? You know, yep. we hold on to life so dearly. And when threatened against it, you know, will obey even the most ridiculous command, even if it's against that's, everything you believe. Yeah, that's true. So, um, I just like to, to to tell everyone that look, we're just coming up on the break, and at the uh, at the end of the other side of the break, it's only a short break. Um, I'd like to during during the break. To jump into the chat room if you can on www.freedomslips.com, jump in the chat, create yourself an ID, and also click the donate button on the left hand side. Okay, that's everyone's task. Everyone who's listening to it right now, it's your task. Go in there and do it. We'll see you on the other side of the break. This shiny side out, episode 108. <laughs>
This is Thomas, a.k.a. a mad painter. I'd like you to join me Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Open Canvas. Don't forget to bring an open mind. Yes, folks, that's right. Bring an open mind to an open canvas. Again, that is Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern. UFOs to government corruption. This is Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. There is no denying the world is awakening. We see it in the global uprisings and demonstrations of the people around the planet and the new way of thinking and living that is arising naturally within each one of us and our communities. I have been a major player in this global shift and movement for over 20 years and have helped tens of thousands of people around the world change their lives and find their voice in order to help create the paradigm change we so desperately need. Join me here at Revolution Radio on the Just Bernard Show every Tuesday at noon Eastern. Eastern Time for two hours of powerful interviews and discussion with some of the most influential visionaries of consciousness, alternative media, and suppressed knowledge. We promise to reveal the real matrix and empower your human experience. Is your data safe? Do you have the necessary information to assist you in confidently living through just about any survival situation? Is survival and gardening, off-grid living, medical knowledge, or even natural or man-made EMPs on your list of personal concerns? Do you have your documents and your personal information in a safe place in your hands where you know where it is? Well, check out our preloaded EMP-proof thumb drive. Over 3 gigs of survival documents and how-tos, plus the USDA offline food preservation website, and much, much more, including a surprise bonus we just can't tell you about here. With plenty of room left over to store your most important documents. Imagine if a mega virus or a computer failure took out your bank, or all the banks for that matter. Are your banking records safe in your hands so when they get things fixed and repaired, you can say, hey, look. This is what I had. You have it. I want it back. Is your personal data safe? Family records, addresses, phone numbers? We'll squeeze on over to freedomslips.com. Yes, that's www.freedomslips.com. Click the banner on the homepage for the EMP proof bullet drive to get the full scoop of everything that we offer. So, folks, keep your data safe for your peace of mind. Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. Thank you for tuning in to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. If you plan to call in and speak with one of our hosts, please turn down your radio and separate yourself from any background noise and wait for the area code to be called on before you speak. And don't forget, Revolution Radio freedomslips.com is listener supported. So stop by the homepage, freedomslips.com, visit the site support area to help support the host you're listening to's airtime. Thank you. Revolution Radio freedomslips.com, where the truth is never sleeps. Revolution Radio. You're listening to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. You're back with David Mickey You're Shiny back. Side Out on freedomslips.com. That's right, the number one listener supported talk radio on the net. Since it is listener funded radio, I hope you did what I asked you to do before the break, and that's jump in and make a small donation to the show. Honestly, it helps run it, and it does cost a fortune to run these things. It's like $1,500 a month or more, and you really need to get in there and, and, um, and assist. If you're not already making a donation, please do it just for me. Please do it, and we don't get paid for this. It just goes to the station. Please do it just for me. Do it for us if you like what we are providing you. Nighthawk is right. He really is. It's an amazing thing to, to be part of this. And you know what? If you do do that, or you do buy a CD from um, the station, it's $30, you can, you can get the, the host that you like, an entire 2013 schedule of all of their shows, all in one, 
there you go, listen to them offline. It's really cool. Um, I'd like to say hello to all the new listeners as well. Uh, I've been receiving email uh, during the week, and it, it's usually good email. A lot of comments on the stuff we paste on Facebook during the week, and the conversations uh, I think are uh, um, incredible that we're having with people. They're, they're Mickey, our listeners are, are really smart. They're doing research. Well, I hope they're, so. They're out there. <laughs> well, they are, and they're really smart. And they're doing things, and they're, they're, they're quite uh, positive towards what we're bringing them. So um, thank you to all of you. We'll, we'll keep doing it. Thank you. You know, it, it helps helps us go along. It helps us breathe every day knowing that we're helping you guys out. Uh, we're halfway through show number 108, and we're talking about deathbed confessions. Mackie. That is correct, sir. Absolutely. Now, um, deathbed confessions, like we uh, alluded to in the uh, first part of the show, are probably confessions that you can uh, put more trust into than others. Uh, certainly more trust than you would uh, if somebody was waterboarded. And the next <laughs> confession <laughs> that we have uh, is um, from E. Howard Hunt. Now, E. Howard Hunt was a key political figure in the 50s and 60s, and as Dave said, he uh, shows up in a few pictures. Um, uh, he graduated from Brown University, served in uh, World War II, and joined the CIA in 1949, which at that time I think was still the OSS. In uh, Guatemala, he helped overthrow the government, partly by airing radio broadcasts from Florida, but pretending to be in the jungle with a guerrilla army. So, you know, he was, uh, he was one of those guys, an active, active kind of guy. <laughs> After stints in Japan and Uruguay, Hunt was sent to Cuba to help organize rebels to take over the government once the CIA ousted Castro in the Bay of Pigs invasion. Except, of course, the Bay of Pigs ended in failure. That never happened. Now, that had two big consequences for Hunt. Number one, he came to resent John F. Kennedy for not being more committed to overthrow Castro. And two... His uh, job changed to focus on domestic issues. He became the first chief of covert action for the CIA's domestic operations division under the Kennedy administration. Part of his job was to give false information to and mislead news organizations. All right, so the fifth column, but uh, internally I did not know, I'll be honest with you, that the CIA had a domestic charter. Um, I thought the CIA was entirely focused on the outside, but you know, I learn something new every day. Um, now, uh, his his son is has written a book, uh, and that book is called um, uh, what is it called? Bond of Secrecy. Bond of Secrecy, and uh, that book contains a number of uh, interesting stories about his uh, life with his father. In fact, it's it's really a recollection of life with his father. Uh, and and uh, well, the you know the frequent absences that he suffered as a child because his father was gallivanting around the world, you know, doing America's bidding. And now, interestingly, interestingly, um, uh, Saint John says in this interview that Kennedy, in his first year of office, learns of the CIA plan to overthrow Castro, uh, and uh, he and his brother Bobby went over to the Cuba project and said, "This is appalling. There were training camps in New Orleans and South Florida." Uh, training mercenaries to attack Cuba, uh, you know, mafia and CIA plots, in fact. And they said, this is insane, it's got to stop. So Bob Kennedy ordered the FBI raids in Miami and New Orleans, and they busted the CIA-funded training camps. And Bobby further said, I will splinter the CIA into a thousand pieces. He, in fact, fired Alan Dulles, you might remember, remember the Dulles brothers, uh, uh, sent uh, James, uh, or, uh, Howard Hunt's boss, right? And his dad, which is, uh, you know, E. Howard Hunt, was demoted after the failed invasion of Cuba. Um, now, Kennedy did go along with the Bay of Pigs, but he didn't want the USA linked. So he didn't want, you know, the linkage to the US. It was just, uh, you know, all organized by uh, disgruntled ex-Cubans. Uh, well, we know that's not true. And now, a lot of people had a lot of reasons to, ri to get rid of J JFK, apparently. He was hated by everybody in the military-industrial complex. Warmongers, big business, and the oil guys. Okay. Now, this is again uh, coming from uh, St. John, uh, who is E. Howard Hunt's son. Kennedy wanted to end the war in Vietnam, go back to the old gold standard, reduce military expenditure, and he was a visionary that had to be gotten rid of. St. John says that LBJ was linked with seven murders and was a vile, underhanded, backstabbing sociopath. I'm quoting, I'm not saying this, guys. <laughs> okay. According to Hunt, the order to assassinate Kennedy came from LBJ, and J. Edgar Hoover was involved. Now, this is where it gets interesting. 
In the summer of 1963, St. John, again, E. Howard Hand's son, says another CIA guy, Bill Harvey, called his father to a big safe house uh, at the uh, UM campus, University of um, Massachusetts, maybe, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, um, with Frank Sturgis, David Morales, and Harvey. And this is what he told me on his deathbed. Okay, this is what E. Howard Hunt told his son on his deathbed. They were putting together an option, an idea, a contingency plan for the big event. For the elimination of a powerful American figure is what they told my dad, being E. Howard Hunt, who would be traveling on business. Everything was on a need-to-know basis, and my dad didn't want to know who it was. The code name for the operation was The Big Event. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the second meeting, in yet another safe house in Florida, the attendees were continuing to lay out their plans, so Hunt asked them, what do you need me for and who are we talking about here? Hunt was astounded when somebody replied, President Kennedy. Now, uh, Hunt apparently was, uh, you know, uh, amazed and uh, he said, you can't be serious, what kind of authorization does this have, how high up does it go? And apparently, as a Cuban attendee replied, we're very serious and this goes all the way to the top all the way to the vice president, who at the time was LBJ, mm -hmm. Lyndon B. Johnson. Okay, now, um, then it gets very interesting uh, in some detail here. St. John believes uh, that the headshot to Kennedy was made by Lucien Sarti behind the picket fence on the grassy knoll, and that an operative named Mac Wallace, whose fingerprints were found, could, all, uh, could have uh, shot also, so, so he could have also fired a shot. It was all pinned on Lee Harvey Oswald and Bill Harvey got Jack Ruby to gun him down. Uh, my dad, being E. Howard Hunt, told me that Jack Ruby, on orders from the Mafia, shot Oswald and it had to be worked out with the Dallas PD, the uh, Dallas Police Department. There's no reason Jack Ruby just snuck there and shot him out of mourning for JFK. I, I mean, I agree with that. Um, so, this is, this is fascinating stuff, Dave, if you think about it, right? Oh, it is, isn't it? I mean, uh, is it true? Well, I don't know. Now, apparently, years later, in 1972, when uh, Watergate happened, um, St. John was the only one at home, and his dad came in and opened the door. He was 17, had long hair, you know, past his shoulders, and he just wanted to uh, smoke weed and play rock music. Um, you know, but he ran upstairs, and he ordered, uh, he ordered, like his father ran upstairs and ordered him to put a Playtex gloves on and get paper towels and Windex and go over a large uh, suitcase of audio equipment. Now, that was stuff, apparently, that was dragged out of Watergate. Uh, St. John helped him clean fingerprints and throw it out and dump it in water. Uh, he also transported large sums of money in manila envelopes. Uh, e. Howard Hunt expected uh, this whole thing to be quashed, no investigation, but he was betrayed with the Bay of Pigs, uh, you know, and he was mm -hmm. betrayed again with Watergate. Um, uh, apparently, St. John was questioned during the Watergate hearings, and he can still uh, be seen in old videos uh, with, uh, you know, long hair and a suit coat. Uh, he lied to the committee, he says, this is the son. Cubans, Gordon, Liddy, and all these guys had been coming to our house. Uh, his dad had told him, say you didn't see them, and um, they had developed a bond of secrecy. Now, uh, St. John further goes on that while criminal proceedings were in process against his dad, his mother died in a plane crash with $10,000 on her. And the cover story was that she was uh, uh, investing uh, with family in, in, uh, in a Holiday Inn, but it was really this is the real story, to pay off people who helped get the bargaining devices for Watergate. St. John thinks the crash was orchestrated, orchestrated to put pressure uh, on his dad. A uh, day after his mother died, uh, his father pled guilty. I guess the, the next person to be killed would have been his son. Mm -hmm. um, now, the day after the plane crash, Nixon appointed one of his close advisors to head the crash in uh, investigation. <laughs> and uh, E. Howard Hunt eventually spent 33 months in jail. Of course, you know, we know that that investigation no that went nowhere. So this is a bit of an insight, I guess, into, into power politics and what we discussed earlier uh, from an insider. And St. John, well, is he telling the truth? Well, I don't know. Uh, he, he, tells, uh, he tells us uh, the things that his father had told him on his deathbed. Uh, you know, LBJ had uh, JFK murdered for various reasons with the help of various other people. Um, it certainly makes sense. You know, you can't really argue with that. Uh, from and, from a go on. Yeah, you know, and, and we we looked at uh, you know some of the reasons for uh, JFK being killed. One of those being, uh, you know, reduce the the dollar down to silver and you know no loans for the bank uh, for yep. the government. Yep. 
Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, like the same thing that that Lincoln tried to do, right? Mm -hmm. Bring bring back uh, the, the well, bring back the greenback, as it were. You know, like mm -hmm. government backed currency rather than than privately backed currency, which is what you guys in the United States have today. You have privately issued currency, not That's government right. issued currency. Now, I know the next one, Dave, must be a very very interesting one for you, sir. Yeah, it is for me. Um, Eisenhower was going to attack Area Fifty One, ex CIA deathbed confession. UFO and author, sorry, UFO author and historian Richard Dolan interviewed anonymously, um, Mr. Anonymous, and I've got a picture of Anonymous uh, on the stream at the moment. Um, it cycles through. Um, he interviewed him in 2013 in the public hearing disclosure um, thing that was going on. So facing impending kidney failure, this individual felt compelled to disclose secret information he feels is too or felt is too important to keep secret. In the video, he claims to have served in the US Army, worked for the CIA, and worked on the US Air Force's Blue Book Project, one of the US Air Force's official studies of UFOs, that was. And he refers to the project as a partial or partially a fraud. Um, asking for clarification, Dolan, Richard Dolan states, you're saying some of the blue book cases were completely fictitious. The anonymous man responds, yes. Anonymous alleges that after an invasion threat from President Dwight Eisenhower, he and his superior at the CIA were allowed inside the secretive Area 51 in Nevada to gather intel and report back to the president. There, anonymous, describes seeing several alien space sorry, spacecraft, including the craft that crashed at Ros Roswell, New Mexico. Then he and his superior were taken to the S-4 facility, which is southwest of Area 51, where they observed live extraterrestrials. His photo's up right now, so you can key it. Um, down, down below is um, is part of D, Dwight D. Eisenhower's 1961 farewell speech in which he, he warned, and this will be in the show notes, you can look it up, um, warned Americans about dangers of military industrial complex. And he, I'll read the actual line, Mickey. We're, we're, um, sure. I didn't want to read the whole thing, but um, only a, um, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. That's we the must... quote I was looking for. That, that is, that's <laughs> awesome. So he warned us, and that's the one that's played everywhere. You'll see him saying that on YouTube and in the yeah. historical files. Um, and he goes on then, I'll cut you off, Mickey, but he says... Well, we must never let the weight of this combination, he's talking about the military industrial complex um, and the councils of government, endanger our liberties or democratic process in which we have already seen. We've, we've let the ball go. We've dropped the ball on this one as citizens of our respective countries. We've let it go and they are completely in control. Um, we should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and a knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals so that security and liber liberty may prosper together. I mean, it's a very it, extraordinary statement coming from the outbound pr um, president, isn't it, Mickey? Yes, sir. That's a very powerful kind of statement to make. <laughs> I mean, you have to bear in mind, though, that, that he was in charge of the... Uh, uh, I guess the invasion forces on D-Day, mm -hmm. and, and then uh, uh, he was he was in charge of the uh, European theater of war during uh, World War II. So he he was a man that had seen battle. Who, who in fact you have to realize something here: the military very very rarely wants to go to war. Like the actual people, right? The, the soldiers, mm -hmm. they will because that's their job, but they don't burn for it, right? They don't really burn for it, especially if they have seen action, especially if, if they have seen war. Who does want to go to war? Are the people that stand to make a profit. Okay, and people make a profit. You, people always say, "Oh, you know, war is so expensive." Yeah, yeah, it costs you and me 
Absolutely. Okay, it's all mm -hmm. taxpayer money. But it goes somewhere. It doesn't just disappear. It doesn't just turn into dust. Someone is earning that money, guys, right? And it, you follow the money trail and you know who wants war. In fact, the Rothschilds, and I hate to say this, but they were supporting both Napoleon and... Uh, um, Oh, what was the uh, the English guy? Oh, I forget now. But anyway, so the, the Battle of Waterloo, right? When the French were mm -hmm. uh, facing off to the English, the, the Rothschilds were supporting both. They were lending money to both. Of course. Because it doesn't matter. It's relevant. Mm -hmm. right? It's who wins, who loses it. It's all about money, the, the, the flow of money. And, and in fact, Rothschilds also said, I, I don't care who rule. I don't care who rules. I'm paraphrasing. I don't care who's in charge. I don't care who the government is. As long as I control the money supply. That's right. right? And that, and that's where we are today, guys. The money supply is controlled by private interests. In fact, in your case, and this is funny, I, I always find this amusing. In the case of the United States, it's it's largely foreign interest groups. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not America. It's not even Americans that control your money. It's that's it's right. foreigners. Mm -hmm. Hurrah! <laughs> but hey, you know, look, yes. that's that's what it is. It's interesting. We we, we don't laugh because we think it's funny. We laugh because you know we've all let it go. Yeah. We all let this happen. Yeah. You know, when rules get fault. changed, when rules get changed in government about ownership, foreign mm -hmm. ownership of your sovereign territories, your soil, your, you know, uh, your money, your financial systems, your companies, whoever they are, you lose that money. It's gone. Yeah. And uh, it's been the biggest mistake of our industrialized civilization to let foreign ownership own you because the only reason they want to own you because then it becomes cheaper for them. Oh, absolutely. Then, then because otherwise they'd be giving you the money. But now you're giving them the money because they bought you out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When, when, does that, when does that give your country a financial incentive to increase its wealth base? It doesn't. It just does not. Uh, yeah, Maggie, that would be never. It doesn't. <laughs> it, it, yeah, look, if, we're all, if we, we all had little stalls at a market, and we were all at home busily making our stuff and we brought it to the market to sell to the customers. And one, one, a new person turns up. We've all been doing reasonably well for each other. Each one of us is an individual country. And mm -hmm. someone comes with their own table and they, and they privately talk to each of us saying, you know what, I can make what you've got on your table and it'll only cost you a dollar. But when you sell it, right, when you make it, instead of you making it, I'll sell it to you. And then, yep. and then they're making the money from your stuff. They end up getting rich and you don't because they're yep. making it for you and all, your money is going to them. Yep. Right? You just become a third wheel and then they can ditch you all together and start selling direct to the same customers. Right? So this is what we've, we've let happen. We're all fools. So, Mackie, on that note... On that bombshell, <laughs> uh, talking about the Hoffa files. Yes, yeah, you're all probably familiar with Jimmy Hoffa. If not, uh, look him up. He was a, a he was a union leader in America, Teamsters yeah, leader, um, and it was back in '75. His or he disappeared back in '75, and the FBI believes uh, that Hoffa was murdered by mobsters. You know, but but uh, nobody has ever figured out who who the actual triggerman was. You know, who was the actual person that pulled the trigger and killed Jimmy Hoffa? <clears throat> now, um, apparently, uh, this is again from uh, this is uh, a deathbed confession here. Uh, the the mob was concerned that Hoffa might reveal the connection between the Teamsters loans uh, to Las Vegas casinos and the cash that was being skimmed from those casinos. So so therefore, that's the rationale. Why Hoffa had to go? No one really disputes this, right? So, so what happened then? Um, now, Hoffa agreed to have a sit down uh, with his uh, mafia nemesis Tony Provenzano to to you know to work out the differences. That was uh, you know the uh, I guess the idea, um, and they were to meet at the Red Fox restaurant in suburban Detroit. Okay, so Hoffa knew you know that he had a target on his back, and I guess he wanted to defuse the situation and maybe come to an arrangement. Uh, Hoffa insisted that at that meeting, his trusted muscle, uh, Frank the Irishman Sheeran, uh, had to be there backing him up. In mob, mob slang, uh, Sheeran painted houses, so apparently that means uh, he killed people. Mm -hmm. uh, Twenty-five to thirty hits in all, and, and most uh, carried out at the orders of mafia kingpin Russell Bufalino. Um, you know, if a guy is going to talk about some doing something, I'm quoting here, he's going to say, he's not going to say, I'm going to go out and, you know, whack this guy, right? Obviously, he's, he will say, 
uh, you paint a house. Uh, and this is coming from uh, Frank Sheeran, the mafia hitman. Um, later in his life, uh, Frank Sheeran uh, was dying of cancer. And uh, he finally told the story about Hoffa's murder uh, to his longtime lawyer, Charles Brandt, who has since written a book um, that is called I Heard You Paint Houses. Uh, I think it's a very colorful mm -hmm. euphemism. Now, uh, apparently it took years before Sheehan told his lawyer everything about the Hoffa hit. Sheeran had already mentioned, uh, oh sorry, he had already been mentioned as a possible suspect in the uh, in a few Hoffa books, um, uh, but he told Brunt he wanted to tell the truth about that day. Again, you know, he wanted to unburden his soul, I guess. Um, it gave me shills, uh, said Brunt. In an interview recorded on video and audio tape, Sheeran slowly filled in the blanks. He and Brunt retraced the events, starting at the restaurant. Sheeran said he was one of three men who arrived in a car to pick up Hoffa, who got into the back seat. The, meet be, the meeting had been moved to a house, uh, they tell Hoffa, rather than the uh, Red Fox restaurant. And the house was on uh, Beverland Street, uh, a short distance away. Hoffa walked into the house uh, with Sheeran behind him. And at that point, uh, Sheeran put two, bullet, uh, two bullets into uh, the back of Hoffa's head. Uh, when he got out of the car at the house and walked in, that's when he got whacked. Hoffa wasn't scared of nothing, uh, Sheeran said. When Sheeran was asked if he was the shooter, he replied, that's right. Uh, now, apparently the whole thing was over in an hour. They didn't start looking for him until 6 p.m. that night. By that, uh, by that time, he was long gone. There is plenty uh, to corroborate Sheeran's story. Uh, for one thing, Hoffa was cautious. He wouldn't have climbed into the car unless someone he knew was there, someone like Sheeran, someone he trusted. And it's, it, it is, in fact, you know, sort of like true mafia style to have that person then, in fact, carry out the hit on him. So, uh, you know, he, you, you heard it uh, here. This, this seems to be a very interesting deathbed confession. Again, Sheehan, well, you could argue maybe he's just trying to, you know, make a, create a bit of fame for himself after his death. But, um, you know, he was connected. He, he was in, in the know. He knew all these people. And uh, maybe he just wanted to come clean and say, look, yeah, I, I did kill... Uh, Jimmy Hoffa, fascinating stuff. Oh, isn't it? Um, it? It never, it never ceases to, to amaze me. And I, I love the euphemisms there. You know that. Yeah. I heard you paint a house. Great. <laughs> I know. It really is. It's like the cleaner from Pulp mm. Fiction. Yep. What are you? I've solved problems. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, but look, this is this is one of those stories, Mickey. The next one coming up that that. Uh, I know. That's that I love. <laughs> I love so much, and um, it's the Roswell theory revived by deathbed confession. And um, let, let's just let's just I'll start with with this bit, yeah. And it's astonishing new twist. Lieutenant Walter Hort was the public relations officer at the base in 1947, and was the man who was issued the original and subsequent press releases after the crash on the orders of the base commander, Colonel William Blanchard. Hort died last year. He died, well, it was actually in 2005, <laughs> uh, but left a sworn affidavit to be opened only after his death. So in 2007, the text was released and asserts that the weather balloon claim was a cover story and that the real object had been recovered by the military and stored in a hangar which lends credibility to everyone else's stories, and the military is just lying once again. Um, he described seeing not just the craft, but alien bodies. UFO pieces handed around. Everyone got them. Hort's affidavit talks about high-level meeting he attended with base commander Colonel William Blanchard and the commander of the 8th Army Air Force, General Roger Ramey. We all have seen the picture and I've got it in the cycle here, um, uh, General at uh, the, the Ramey's office picture, which is uh, so famous now just to only have, you know, weather balloon debris in it. And the guy mm. has been threatened. He, he says, Port states that at this meeting, pieces of wreckage were handed around for participants to touch with nobody able to identify the material. He says the press release was issued because locals were already aware of the crash site, but in fact, there had been a second crash site where more debris from the craft had fallen. The plan was that an announcement acknowledging the first site 
which had been discovered by a farmer, would divert attention from the second and more important location. Oh. <laughs> then comes the, the clean-up operation. Hi, Hi SJ in the chat room. Um, Hort also spoke about a clean-up operation where for months afterwards, military personnel scoured both crash sites, searching for all remaining pieces of debris, removing them and erasing all signs that anything unusual had occurred. This ties in the claims made by locals that debris is collected and as souvenirs was seized by the military. I mean, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people out there, you know, holiday hunting. Um, oh. Hort then tells how, or told, how Colonel Blanchard took him to building S4, one of the hangars at Roswell, and showed him the craft itself. He describes a metal, metallic, egg-shaped object around 3.6 metres to 4.5 metres in length and around 1.88 metres wide. He said he saw no windows, wings, tail, landing gear or any other feature. He saw two bodies on the floor partially covered by a tarpaulin. There, sorry, they are described in his statement as about 1.2 metres tall with disproportionately large heads. Towards the end of the affidavit, Hort concludes, I am convinced that what I personally observed was some kind of craft and its crew from outer space. What's particularly interesting about Walter Hort is that in the many interviews he gave before his death, he played down his role and made no such claims. <laughs> he played games. <laughs> he played ball, didn't he, Mickey? Oh, yeah. That's what it really means. He'd been seeking publicity. No, had he been seeking publicity, sorry, um, he would surely have spoken about the craft and the bodies. But, you know, his did he fear ridicule or was the affidavit a sort of deathbed confession from someone who had been part of a cover-up. Now, I have to say, um, to have it only opened and announced after your death, he can't possibly have made anything from it. it no. You know, you know, so I think it's it's fantastic. But look, to go on, Mackie, this ties in so closely to Hort, and, I, and yes. I'd love you to read this. Now, I've got a picture in the slideshow of, of Ben Rich, but tell us more about him. Ben Rich. Now, Ben Rich is the Lockheed CEO um, and admits on deathbed, ET, UFO are real. Um, ben uh, Rich was the Lockheed Skunk Work CEO and admitted that in his deathbed confession. Uh, that's, that's a picture of him. Um, now, he, he revealed uh, that uh, UFO visitors are real and the US military is traveling among the stars. Okay. Mm. Now, according that's to an article that was... News. Isn't it though, mm -hmm. right? I mean, hello, what? Um, and that was uh, that was posted back in 2010. In fact, so this is this is not new news. Um, according to an article that was published in May 2010 in the issue of, um, sorry, in the, in the May 2010 issue of MUFON, UFO Journal, uh, Ben Rich, the father of the stealth fighter bomber, by the way, and former head of Lockheed Skunk Works, had once let out information about extraterrestrial UFO visitors are real and U.S. military travel to stars. Mm -hmm. What he said. Might be new to many people today, but he revealed the information before his death in January 1995. Okay, um, his statements helped to give credence to reports that the U.S. military has been flying vehicles that mimic alien craft. Uh, the article was written by Tom Keller, who himself is an aerospace engineer who has also worked as a computer systems analyst for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratories. Okay. So, and I'm going to, there's a few points here I'm going to list out to you guys. Um, inside the Skunk Works, which is Lockheed's secret research and development entity, you might have heard of it. Uh, we mentioned it in connection with uh, Zero Point Energy mm -hmm. Research. Uh, we were a small, intensely cohesive group consisting of about 50 veteran engineers and designers and 100 or so expert machinists and shop workers. Our forte was building technologically advanced airplanes of small number and of high class for highly secret missions. Uh, two, we already have the means to travel among the stars, but these technologies are locked up in black projects and it would take an act of God to ever get them out to benefit humanity. Anything you can imagine, we already know how to do. Three, we now have the technology to take ET home. 
right? And this is a like a classic movie. Right? Yeah. <laughs> no, it won't take someone's lifetime to do it either. There's an error in the equations. We know what it is. We now have the capability to travel to the stars. First, you have to understand that we will not get to the stars using chemical propulsion. Well, I never thought we would. Yeah, Second, would we have to devise a new propulsion technology. What we have to do is find out where Einstein went wrong. We Ooh. all know Einstein's constant. Correct. Mm -hmm. When Rich was asked how UFO propulsion worked, he said, let me ask you, how does ESP work? Uh -huh. The questioner responded with, all points in time and space are connected. Rich then said, that's how it works. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to quickly say something here, guys, okay? Please. Um, we've, we've spoken about this, and it forms part of our hypothesis. We, we, I think we have, well, we haven't proven that time and space don't exist. I think we have we've, um, shed a sufficient uh, doubt onto the concept of time and space to now question its reality. We, we all know about spooky action at a distance, right? We, we know that you can uh, quantum entangle uh, two particles. Mm -hmm. We also know that we can uh, freeze light. That has now happened in a right. in an experimental setting, right? So so light is, is, is has been frozen in a crystal for a minute by some German scientists. So now, if 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 spooky action at the distance tells us something, is that space or distance, I should say, does not really exist. Right? I love this little uh, uh, example that is given by a fish in an aquarium. So you've got an aquarium and there's one fish in it. And uh, there's one camera which is at the um, at one side of the aquarium, you know, the, the, where the fish, let's say, faces. And the other camera is on the other side of the aquarium, let's say, looking at the fish on the side. All right? Now mm -hmm. you've got two cameras, potentially on two different monitors, you see two fish. All right? One fish head on and the other fish on the side. Uh, or, you know, depending on how the fish moves. Now, as, as you keep watching the, the, the monitors, you will see that when one fish moves, the other fish moves at exactly the same time. Right? No lag. Not knowing, of course, that you're looking at the very same fish. Mm -hmm. Now, let's, let's take this a little bit further. So, if, what if, if there truly was no distance uh, in, in, in our universe? Like, mm -hmm. this is all just an illusion, right? Uh, we all, in fact, we're not looking at two particles that are entangled, it's the same particle, but looked at from two different points of view. Now this is where hyperdimensional mathematics comes in and uh, I'm not an expert, but if you can bend your mind around that, you will also realize that that means there can't be any time. Because what is time? Well, time is motion through space. If everything is frozen and there's no motion, there nothing no moves, time. then there's no time. Exactly. Boom, right? So if there's no space, then ergo, QED, quadrat demonstrandum, there is no time. Because it's an illusion. Now, this is amazing stuff. Now, if, if that is truly true, and we seem to... Now, let me go back to Mr. Rich here. <laughs> he seems to say the very same thing. All points in time and space are connected. Well, all points in time and space are just the one point. There is no time and space as such. Mm -hmm. only, our, only our perception of it. Only yes. our experience of it. And that's where it gets interesting. So... Traveling through time and space becomes very, very simple at that point, you know, it once you've made that leap. Mickey, right? I, so, so, I, I, I want to bring one point forward here. Um, Please. I want to enlarge a point, and, and that is that he, Ben Rich says that there are two types of UFOs the hmm. ones we build and ones they build. Yep. We learnt from both crash retrievals and actual hand me downs. Hand-me-downs. You don't get a hand-me-down from a complete stranger, yeah? You get a hand-me-down <laughs> from a friend. These, yeah, that's right. these people, the visitors, gave them some old tech. The government knew and until 1969 took an active hand in the administration of that information. After 1969, Nixon's purge, administration was handled by an international board of directors in the private sector. Mm -hmm. That can't be understated. Back to you, Mickey. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, interestingly enough as well, n nearly all biomorphic aerospace designs were inspired by the Roswell spacecraft. Uh, from Kelly's SR-71, uh, Blackbird, onward to today's drones, UCAFs, and so forth, right? Now, uh, biomorphic meaning, of course, mimicking 
mimicking uh, true uh, living creatures. You know, we, we've seen this, the, the designs we, we have now are no longer, uh, you know, really angular, except for the stealth bomber, but that's, uh, you know, due to other facts. You know, they're, they're much more organic, or they seem more organic, uh, more, more lifelike uh, in their design, and that was inspired by the Roswell craft. Hey, Mickey, it was Ben Riches. Yeah. Mickey, Mickey the, the uh, 777, Boeing 777, is, uh, is also utilizing the lifting body shape. Yes. Uh, which is more shark like. Yes. As well. So yes. you're right. It's, no, it's that, that, mim mim mimicking nature and, the, and the, what we found to be uh, these uh, craft. Go ahead. Co correct. And then from, from, from the space design, in fact, it, it went on to uh, everyday. Uh, objects, cars as well, you know, but but even things that mm -hmm. uh, you have, like even even your Apple computer, for instance, you know, or, or, yeah, or your, your, your 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 yeah, your smart device. Oh, oh, I mean, anyway, so so that that's that's all flowing from it. Now, it was Ben Rich's opinion that the public should not be told uh, about uh, UFOs and extraterrestrials. He believed they could not handle the truth ever, ever. Now that's a big, that's a long time. And um, only in the last months of his decline did he begin to feel that the International Corporate Board of Directors, again corporate board of directors, mm -hmm. dealing with the subject could represent a bigger problem to citizens' personal freedoms under the United <laughs> States Constitution than the presence of off-world visitors themselves. Yeah, that, yeah. That's, that's a good insight, right? Maybe a little late, but I agree. Um, now, uh, there, there are other um, uh, things here can, can uh, mentioned in this that, article. I, I Please. Yeah. Anti-gravitational oh. research was going on. We knew that there was some captured craft from 1947 in Roswell. Mm. They were real. Mm -hmm. And yes, we really mm. did get some technology from them. And yes, we really did put it to work. We knew, yeah. we knew each other from what we call an unseen industry. We can, mm -hmm. we can term it black, deep black or hidden. Uh, th these quotes, these come from him. And, yeah. and he's talking about Kelly Johnson. What yes. he talked about from him, and you know, it, it honestly, he uh, Don Phillips, I think these UFOs were huge and would just do, just come to a stop and do a sixty degree, forty five, ten degree turn, and then immediately reverse this action. During the Apollo landing, Neil Armstrong says, "They're here, they're right <laughs> over there, and looking at the sign, looking." At the size of those ships, it's it is obvious that they don't like us being here. And there's yeah. also another quote. There's two other quotes from from Neil Armstrong um, and Buzz on the surface, and he asks him. One asks the other. He says, "Did you put the mirrors back up?" And he said, "Yes, but they'll only knock them down again." <laughs> now there's only two guys on the whole moon, <laughs> and they're talking to each other, referring to a third party. Yeah. So I, I have to tell you, I, I think it's, um, there's, you know, I just, I just want all at Mickey. You're on my, you're, you're on board with me, right? I just I'm boarding. I want this <laughs> stuff out. I want this stuff out yeah. there. Let's open up the closet. Let's, let's air it out. Let's get it out there. All, all of this stuff right now, you know, if, if he, if, if Ben Ridge says that the U.S. military are already flying to the stars, I completely believe him. I believe yeah. that some of those, you know, close-up photographs of meteorites and things in our solar system, which would be impossible. Also, let me let me put this one out there. I'm going to say it right here, right now, um, that Mars rocks are impossible to determine on Earth that it comes from Mars. I don't care who you are. I honestly don't. There's no equal equal proof that any rock found on Earth has come from anywhere else. Unless we've been to the moon, then we could say it was a moon rock if we found mm. it on Earth. But we can't because we've never been to Mars and we don't know what rocks are on... and we can't compare them. We don't know their true age. We just don't. We don't know this stuff. So that's my bugbear about you know them declaring, oh, Mars rock has life in it. And it was on Earth, and it was a meteorite. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. I hear what you're saying. Look, uh, yeah, look, that that that's a fair point. That's a fair point. I mean, you know, um, because we we've we've been there. Yes, yes, we have, but we have not come back yet. 
that's right. No one has come come back. That's that's the thing. Um, so uh, and again, well, sorry, no, that's not entirely true. That's 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 what they want us to believe. I believe we have been there, and we are there now. That's in what fact. I believe too. Um, the, the moon as well, and well, actually maybe not the moon. Maybe the moon is uh, off limits for us. Maybe that's like the guardhouse, you know, where we can't go. I don't know. Uh, who, who knows? I mean, <laughs> maybe the, the the you know that TV series uh, Stargate. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a movie once as well. Um, again, we we've talked about jump rooms and Stargates uh, as well, and uh, people that uh, uh, have seen them or worked with them used them. Uh, we've also talked about the Stargates being used for time travel potentially. Um, who knows? Hey, I mean, the thing is this, this is a fascinating world we live in, and, and a lot of the stuff is being kept from us, so you need to ask yourself, uh, what can we do to, to find out more? What can we do to unearth the truth? Whom can we believe? And this is the reason why we brought you this show here today. Um, these, these people, uh, being at death's door, uh, literally had, had nothing left to lose, um, uh, you know, uh, and uh, maybe they wanted to come clean some of the things they said and some of the information that's trickling through. People always say, oh, you know, but there's no evidence and no one ever talks about it. Well, then people do talk about it. There is evidence, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's just it's just ignored. Again, it's, it's um, you know, it's ignored to the point where it, it's silence becomes its, its death knell. You know, it's, you, you, if you don't repeat it, you, you, you can never ever discuss it and it doesn't become a truth, you know, and then, you know, on the flip side, if you repeat something often enough, even if it's a lie, it, it will eventually the become the truth. Exactly. Yeah. So the evidence is there. The people have made the statements, okay, astronauts, um, and, and now we see, like, <laughs> CEO, so the CEO of Skunk Works, guys, right? Uh, the CIA insiders, mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, they are all there. I mean, we, we brought you a, a large spectrum of deathbed confessions for the simple reason, I mean, that's the show, I mean, including, you know, of course, the, the Hoffa assassination, you know, as well as uh, uh, um, ADHD and, and mm -hmm. you know, so it, it's important to, to look at it all, right? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. The, the one thing that got me about the Ben Rich one was the, the question that you have to ask yourself, what have they been doing for 25 years? If the stealth fighter, you know, we only see what they've made when they usually decommission it. The stealth fighter was the first thing that they've made at the Skunk Works, which has um, been in the public eye and still been in active operation, active service. Yep. yep. It's the only one. So from the SR-71 Blackbird up until the stealth fighter, what have they worked on? And what are they working on now? Yeah. Well, what are they working? That's the thing. What are mm -hmm. they working on now? There's right. That's what I want to know. Turning up every single day. There's still employees yep. every single day being flown from uh, the Las Las Vegas you know, airport, going to black buses, still turning up every day. Uh, uh and make no mistake, there's actually um, it was actually that uh, facility, um, uh, or um, well, let's call it Area 51, which which uh, had people dying in, in quite large numbers. They went to court because they didn't know what they were dying from, mm -hmm. and the court denied their request of disclosure, mm -hmm. meaning it was deemed nationally more important to keep the secret of what's killing them mm -hmm. than making sure that they can get the adequate treatment. Exactly. Right now, that's 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 pretty serious stuff here, guys. Yeah, an impartial judge, impartial, huh? Um, do you know all all of this? Well, it's been an exciting show, I have to say that. Yeah? Mm. Um, but but for me, oh, and by the way, if you want to call in, uh, we'll take a couple of calls just in the last few minutes. Um, but and and that was to you, area code six one seven. By the way, if you want to call back. Um, it's something really weird about all of this is they talked uh, he talk, uh, spoke specifically about that international board you know panel um, who decides everything doesn't that just sound doesn't that reek of Illuminati yes they're in control of everything good for you well <laughs> you know, good for you whoever you are you know yay I like my big screen TVs I'm doing the right thing we're raising questions because you know what we we really want is for this info to come out. I think it's time. I really do. There's enough. I reckon in a 24-hour broadcast on the Science Channel or the History Channel, 
there's enough talk about UFOs being real already that it's enough for mm -hmm. me to say, you know what, I think the world's ready for it, let's do it. We've come a long way. Let, let's make no mistake here, guys, right? Now, I, I don't disagree with not all, it's not, not all information is for all people. It really isn't, right? Because yeah, some, there's some people out there that can't be trusted with, with some information. I get that. No argument here. But from, from the 40s, 50s to now, we, we have very different mindsets uh, for the most part. Not everybody, but a lot of people are a lot more informed, a lot more educated, a lot more open-minded as well. I mean, the, the greatest fear, I think, that people or the people in power had was that this information may... Uh, potentially bring about the end of our civilization, meaning, uh, you know, uh, well, you know, there's, because that's, that's what's happened every time a superior civilization has come in contact with a less advanced civilization. <laughs> you know, uh, for example, you know, it, but that, that's what happened in Africa, in the Americas, mm -hmm. to some extent as well, you know, where we're in, uh, well, maybe not more advanced, but certainly more aggressive, right? <laughs> Uh, civilization brought about the end of, of really massive kingdoms, uh, uh, if, you, if you look at it. Yes. Fantastic. Now, um, uh, my vid is on, I thought. Um, hang on, here we go. But it's, it's certainly very interesting that this information is being kept secret still. I mean, two reasons. One, uh, someone is making a buck of it, right? Mm -hmm. Someone is, is getting some profit out of it uh, and, and doesn't want to get let that go. Two, um, it's too explosive still. I mean, what we're talking about might not even be the tip of the iceberg, right? It might be even it might might be much deeper. Maybe we are a lost colony. Maybe we've already colonized space. Maybe there was a massive war in space. Maybe we are the uh, uh, pariahs of 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 this galaxy. You know, maybe this is a prison colony. I, I don't know, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what is the truth? I mean. Um, why are we here? Um, again, the hypothesis answers some of those questions. It doesn't answer, though, why we would be imprisoned here if, in fact, this were a prison. Uh, it, it is, it is a, a fascinating subject. And, and I do believe, though, uh, that the information is out there. I, I do believe, of course, that everything is knowable. Right? We, we might be limited in our present form, maybe physically, maybe, maybe biologically, I don't know, mm -hmm. maybe spiritually, I don't know. But, but I believe that everything is knowable. Everything is understandable if you're advanced enough to understand it. Yeah, you know, why why don't we just release it all before um, the the, uh, the gods tell us that they we've been bad and we need to uh, erase history again and go through another mm. cycle? Yeah, I think we need to beat. You know, I'm so, sort of saying this tongue in cheek, but I think we need to to beat the issue. Let's let's get mm -hmm. it out there because once we you know once we, we we bring it in and we talk about you know the elephant, if no one can see the elephant in the room, and that is that aliens are real. Yeah, then mm -hmm. we're we're hiding ourselves from it. I think the moment we we embrace it, you know, and it could be as simple as saying, actually, you know what, we've found, you know, industrialized civilization on another planet. We found the all the hallmarks of it. We found CFCs. We found because you know chlorofluorocarbons. Yeah, they're made by also made by um, by volcanoes, but. We could say that there's a, I forget which one it is, it's not H3, there's another one, there's another chemical that's only like plastic, it's, it has to be manufactured, and mm. if we can find that in their atmosphere, um, then there's all of the hallmarks, and I can't remember which one it is, Mekki. I think it's not carbon. carbon. I think it's carbon monoxide. Right, yep. Yep. Because we breathe out carbon dioxide, um, yep. and yeah, so carbon monoxide, if we find that in the atmosphere, we know that they're by they you know they're, they're burning fossil fuels or whatever yeah um but why don't they just announce that it doesn't even have to be real <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. So again, maybe they can still use that information for their own gain. Maybe, maybe we're looking at a, and in fact, this is what I remember was. Well, I think Oppenheimer said this. Mm -hmm. uh, the 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 last false flag will will in fact be um, an alien attack, and I That's think right. Reagan mentioned something like that, right? Yep. It'll be now we've we've had all the terrorist attacks, we had the natural disasters, we had all that um, uh, disease to some extent, uh, and the next big one potentially it could be an alien. I don't want to say alien, a visitor or maybe a, a, a pseudo-visitor attack or, or intervention or, or event. Let's call it the event. An event, yeah. Uh, so, still, uh, again... A bit from, the, from the news story. But, um, Mekki, just imagine, <laughs> imagine if, uh, you know, Ben Rich said that, that we're making them and they're making them. So, if we're yes. making them and they're indistinguishable to all intents and purposes as the, as the real thing, because they are the real thing, 
then mm -hmm. then it could be faked. Oh, absolutely. They completely fake it. Yeah. You know, in, in real life, they could do something so extraordinary that, you know, suddenly there's a UFO hovering over every major city. We'd take notice. I think we'd, we'd <laughs> that would be important. Absolutely. Look, yeah, I think I think we would, right? Like like Independence Day um, style. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. They could, they could they could say something as simple as you know, um, you need one world government to communicate with the Galactic <laughs> Federation. Yeah. We won't. We're not going to handle a whole bunch of separate countries. Forget it. One world government. Yep. Let's do it right now. You you do yep. that right right now. We'll land and we can we can start you know spark up a a treaty or something. Oh, and by the way, we all need to get microchips because you can't manage a population if you don't have microchips. Oh, yeah, that's right. Boom! You know, there it goes. It's, yeah, hey, um, <laughs> it's just another market to be exploited, right? Maybe they, they believe in free market capitalism. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> fascinating, though, in the movie they live, that's exactly the premise that was made. Oh, <laughs> and that's wow. it, guys. <laughs> I, I was referring to the fourth kind last night. And dash cam video of that awesome stuff. Uh, great film if you haven't seen it. Hey, um, there's the music, Mickey. Yeah, it went quick, mate. It did. It went Look, quick. <laughs> we'll see you all next week for show 109. Stay Absolutely. Tuned and don't forget, get the application for your phone. Search for Shiny Side Out on all of the smartphone stores. Take care, everyone.